Good morning. Welcome to the Arthritis Broadcast News. We're here up at Whistler having the CRA convention as our lovely backdrop. Today I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Janice McCaffrey, who is a GP but also a patient herself and is part of our patient advisory boards here in the Lower Mainland. Good morning. Good and morning, welcome, Jan. Thank you pleasure for talking to, have you. to me. I really it's, appreciate it. It is our pleasure. It's interesting. I had never heard of an antinuclear antibody, or sorry, the AMA negative lupus. Could right. you elaborate on that, please? Well, I'll elaborate on it because I'm one of those 2% um, of lupus patients who tested negative for antibodies when they were trying to find out why I went into acute kidney failure. So it was pretty exciting times when I got sick. Um, and so I guess I was curious about it because I sort of wondered uh, with previous symptoms when I had been tested and was antibody negative and we couldn't come up with an answer, I realized that I'm not the only person that this has happened to. So I wanted to talk to the guru of this phenomenon. Uh, who is a wonderful woman, well known in the rheumatologic community, mm -hmm. by the name of Daphna Gladman, who is at the Western Ontario Research Institute at the University of Toronto, I think I've got that right. Anyway, she was saying that about 2% of lupus patients uh, don't test positively uh, for antibodies in the way that we typically test them. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about um, the problems with the testing. Suffice it to say, though, that not everybody, every lab, tests the same way, uses the same kind of test, or uses the same kind of test in the same kind of way. So across the country, there are kind of different ways of doing the test, and it's not standardized. And um, you know, I was explaining to Daphna from a patient point of view, this creates a lot of frustration and confusion. So, you know, you've got a, a kind of test that isn't administered the same way by every lab, so that's a problem. And then you've got a disease that's just a crazy making disease because often you can have many kinds of symptoms and syndromes before your blood work actually turns positive, even if you were testing it at a good lab that was doing it the right way. But Jennifer, I might interrupt, why? I mean, you've been saying, are, is the lab testing not standardized? Why do we have these variables? Um, you know, I, I, I can't answer that. I'm not a, a pathologist. I don't work in a lab. Um, uh, all I know is that when when I was finally diagnosed and my blood work did show positive antibodies, the blood work had to be sent to a special lab in Calgary to have it looked at more closely. There was enough about my blood that was suspicious, um, so they sent it off and indeed I tested positive when the test was done in a certain way. And the rest of my symptoms by that time, and especially with my renal bi biopsy, then made the diagnosis of lupus. Um, uh, uh, absolutely positive. It just brought to mind all these patients that I would have seen over the years where it's just been so frustrating to get to a diagnosis. So in this day and age of modernity where um, you know we have all these fancy kind of tests to not be able to you know to still have it take years to diagnose somebody um, is frustrating. Yes. And how long have you been living with this? Well, I was diagnosed in 2006. Okay. So I just periodically keep looking into this antibody situation and keep asking, is there a better biomarker that we can look at? Because the ANA is uh, fraught with difficulty. It's not just the test itself. Then there's the whole idea that uh, doctors are told that they test too much. Yes. You, know, you do the antibody yes. test too much. And I've yes. had patients who come in and say, well, my other doctor wouldn't do an ANA test. And the thing is, you have to be judicious about using the test, or you end up, you end up instead of thinking about the patient and examining the patient, you just write the, you write a request for the test. And that is not a very responsible way to 
order a test. You, you really should be looking at the patient, listening to the patient, and then deciding if the test is a reasonable thing to do. So you shouldn't be, a patient, I don't think, should be really upset with their doctor if they won't order a test. If that doctor has sat with them, taken a proper history, mm -hmm. looked at them, and explained, you know what, there just isn't enough to warrant doing the test. That's an explanation I could accept. Uh, but you know, and then and then you know, you have to look at the other side when you do have enough and the test is warranted. Once it's done and it's positive, you don't need to keep doing it. If you have a diagnosis and it's positive, you don't you don't need to keep doing your ANA test. Is your lupus well managed now? Uh, you know, it's been hiccupy. I have to say, it hasn't been smooth sailing. Okay. Be nice that you just take your drugs and it all goes away. But we all know. We all know. That's <laughs> not the way it goes. Jen, as a GP, I also know that you have two areas of interest. Uh, and I'd like to have you share those with us. One is acupuncture, and yes. the other is immunization. Okay, so um, I was really interested by the talk, and there was an interview at the, with the ABN of Dr. Sang, Dr. Wong, and Dr. Kohler, Barry Kohler who, uh, in a tongue-in-cheek kind of way, were talking about traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture mm -hmm. particularly, in particular, and whether it works. And it's a, it's a very big question, because I guess it depends on who you ask as to whether it works. But the, but the whole idea is, could, could, could TCM and acupuncture have a role in treating uh, autoimmune or rheumatic disease? And, um, I think what they were saying was that um, they think there's something there, we have to prove it in the Western kind of way mm -hmm. in order to embrace it and encourage patients to use it. And of course, it's not that, I mean, some doctors just are simply not open to the idea of it. I've run into that myself because I've trained in acupuncture. Mm -hmm. Fine, you know, that's, they're allowed to make their judgments. But I think, I think what Dr. Sang, Wong, and Kohler are trying to say is we want it to be credible. We don't want to send patients on wild goose chases when you know, we put ourselves through such rigor mm -hmm. to make sure that our drugs work, they're tested out the yin yang, pardon me, and you know, have to go through so many levels of approval to use various drugs and treatments. Why aren't we putting TCM and acupuncture with, through the same kind of rigorous testing? And then we would be happy to recommend it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, to say to people, yes, go do this, we're not sure it might, you're going to spend a lot of money because it's certainly not covered by medical to a large extent. And, um, you know, some private insurance carriers will cover it. It is a big deal to tell the patient it might work, go spend the money, make the commitment. Um, so they they are making efforts to 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 see that this is um, so there is a movement afoot to try to have this um, with great skepticism by some, but these guys are going to try and have a, a decent look at it. Now I come at it from an interesting point of view in my mind because. Uh, when I gave up obstetrics in 1994, mm -hmm. uh, I had done my thousand deliveries. Within three years, I had an adult medicine practice. Mm -hmm. um, and most of my practice was some kind of pain people were in, right, or uh, some kind of unhappiness. Mm -hmm. So an adult medical practice is kind of depressing in a way. It's very you know, Aside from screening, you're dealing with unhappy yes. or sick people right. or people in pain. That's okay, that's what the job is. But I decided I was going to learn traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture to deal with pain because people, especially older people, they, they're not interested or can't take a lot of drugs. You know, they don't want to have to. So I, I, look, I read about acupuncture and it fascinated me. And I went and learned how to do traditional acupuncture. Where? Um, through the Acupuncture Foundation of Canada, which is a, a, a a body that certifies um, acupuncturists and TCM practitioners for physicians, dentists, and physiotherapists. Mm -hmm. so, so, so this organization has existed for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And I referred these guys to the research that probably is available on their website, that they have done proper research studies that have looked at the efficacy 
of acupuncture in low back pain, mm -hmm. headache, uh, nausea in pregnancy. Now we're starting to see um, uh, fertility clinics using traditional acupuncture. Uh, we're starting to see acupuncture creep up in palliative care for constitutional pain tolerance and for nausea. It's, we're starting to find it in Now, when you finish training, did you go back and actually start to implement it on your own patients? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And what were your findings? Well, um, it's, you know, the problem is it's anecdotal, and this has no credibility in the eyes of Western medicine. And fair enough, we need to show that this happens over and over again consistently to a uh, significant number of people that there is benefit. I found it was fascinating, it was beneficial in so many ways, and not just for pain-related things, um, allergies, uh, asthma, uh, menstrual cycle dysfunction, it was fascinating. And, you know, believe me, I've had these patients for years, they've been maxed out on their medical treatment, and a series of acupuncture treatments, um, and, uh, you know, based on the criteria by which you do it for that disorder, very interesting results. So I decided I would study further in acupuncture, and I started hearing about Chan Dunn, who has pioneered the theory of intramuscular stimulation with needles, so acupuncture needles into a short, irritated muscle that's traumatized, strained, uh, inflamed. And this is not traditional acupuncture, so you shouldn't mix them up. Okay. But my desire to help people treat pain is what led me to him. Can we back up just for a second? Yeah. How is that not the same as traditional acupuncture? Traditional acupuncture points are based on a long history of uh, meridians or channels of energy through the body that are associated with theoretical concepts of um, organ function and energy, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what, what, what would be called liver, for instance, in traditional Chinese medicine, does not mean the organ as we see it. So there are these, it's a completely different uh, way of seeing the organism, the, the human body and how it functions and how its energies are produced and balanced. Mm -hmm. Right? So those acupuncture points, the traditional points, um, have been ascribed to different meridians or channels through the body. And those are very different points to, to give acupuncture to than a painful muscle point and a short muscle in a muscle belly along the back or your calf or your shoulder or wherever, uh, which is not a traditional acupuncture point. So you're dealing with, uh, with a very specific part of the muscle that's um, that's injured, uh, whereas a traditional point can be in a muscle, but it can also be in other spaces and places in the body. You're passionate about it. I can feel it. I can hear it. And I'm excited by it. And I think that, was just, before we get into immunization, oh, yeah. could we just have a look at how social media can come with this? Because now is the time. We have come to an age where patients have got to stand up and advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. And if they think that there is some form, you know, perhaps acute acupuncture, acupressure, whatever, that could help them live with their, their autoimmune disease or just disease in general. Well, I'll, I'll tell you where I think acupuncture is going to go, and then we'll go to social okay. media. Okay. That's important. But, okay. You know, the way, so I believe in acupuncture. Um, you know, the evidence, I think, in the next 20 years will come out in a form that Western medical doctors will accept it. That's my hope. But where I see traditional acupuncture helping, is to balance okay. Okay. balance the body, constitutional symptoms of energy, well-being, uh, that kind of thing. That's where the traditional fits. Um, I would also say that acupuncture on some of the joints themselves. I've done acupuncture on arthritic knees before, right in the joint. Very, very interesting. All I'll say is that has been my experience. Where Chan Gun's treatment comes in the dry needling, I see that as very specific to tight bands of chronically tight and taut muscles over the years with joints that don't move very well. For instance, you know, people talk, oh, my shoulders are so tight, my shoulders are always up. Well, I get IMS acupuncture every six months to release my shoulders, release my back, release things that are starting to get bound up because of ways that I can't move very well. 
and that is very different than traditional acupuncture, where you get your, where you get more balanced and more general constitutional symptoms addressed. So that's where I see it going. As a, oh, I, 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 as a, as a lay person who knows nothing really about acupuncture, forgive me if this is an ignorant question, but how does a tendon machine and its behavior does it is it similar into how the acupuncture uh, work? Are they just two completely you know, different sciences? And uh, I think they are different. And I don't know. I I mean, it's possible that hands can be set up to stimulate traditional points. But I, you know what? I don't know enough to comment in a. No. Okay, fair enough. It, fair I enough. can comment in a fakely intelligent. <laughs> You're a very intelligent woman. <laughs> now, which I know but immunization. Media. Oh, yeah, social media. So right. social media, you know what? Social media, we're doing it. It's going to happen. You know, I, the Twittering and the Facebook groups and all of this is has got a life of its own, and the way in which it works is going to survive, and the way in which it doesn't is going to fall uh, off and right. spin off. The, the uh, so thing I want to just point out uh, is that I don't know where doctors are going to fit themselves into this. Right? Um, and the reason I get kind of verklempt about it is because I think there's an expectation that because we have it and we can do it, we should. And, you, and I go, oh, oh, wait a minute. Because my concern is the continuity of the patient record. And so if you've got doctors that start talking to their patients over email, uh, or they Twitter something out that is a therapeutic recommendation as right. opposed to have a look so at this, what do you think? I didn't tell you that, you know, I'm not giving you a prescription. Like, where, where does it cross the line between a doctor saying what they think and what's new and that being interpreted as I should do this, mm -hmm. which is actually prescriptive. Mm -hmm. okay? So there's that kind of okay. difficulty. Then the other thing is you email, you text, you know, if you have email, you have text, you're on Facebook as a physician with your patients. Where is the patient's medical record? How does, how do all these ways of communicating get funneled into one story about the patient? Because if we start doing therapy over email and some of it's on Facebook and it becomes fragmented, it's not a whole story, and it's your story, and your story is important, and the details of your story are important. You know, let's, say, let's say you get into some kerfuffle and you email your physician and he says, well, change this dose and do that, um, and you go do that, it, he doesn't go and write that in your chart. And you have to go see someone else in Toronto, and this, there's this big chunk that's missing because it happened on three different technologies. You're Ethics. shortchanged yes. of the continuity of your story. I worry about that. I don't know why I worry about that, but I worry about that. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, none of these things, and this is kind of what stymies technological process, I think, in healthcare systems in the doctor's office, in hospital, in the health authorities, is the privacy and security of that kind of communication. Mm -hmm. So doctors are starting to do email with patients. The thing is, it's not necessarily secure. Mm -hmm. Anybody can hack in, and we worry so much yes. about the privacy of our information yes. and, and giving it to people. Yes. Um, and you think about how easily uh, or how insecure some of these forms of communicating are, and we're putting our whole life out there. Right. I I worry about that about patients. The question is, do patients worry about it? Maybe you don't worry about it. I was talking to another a, a patient yesterday who said, you know, I've got all my whole history on this website that I pay to be part of. I don't know if it's secure or not. I don't care. Oh. I want to follow yes. my illness. Yes. So, I'm understanding that some of this is driven by patients, and you've got doctors who've got their, their heels in. They want to embrace it, but they're, they've got their heels in because the patient's story is getting fragmented. There's no privacy. There's no security. Are you worried? Yes, and plus, too, this must drive the ethics committees crazy. It's what employs ethicists. Yes. I mean, this is where everybody gets stuck. Yes. Everybody. Yes. Uh, so it's not resolved. And never mind the fact that hospitals, health authorities, and doctors' offices are silos with their 
information technology. You would think, after all these years of it's all going to be on computer, uh -huh. these people would talk to each other. Yes, yes, they don't talk to each other. Oh, okay. I can't go in to the health authority's immunization data bank and get the immunization information on a kid in my practice. Oh. Nor can they go into my <laughs> practice and get it from me. Oh, okay. With my electronic medical oh, okay. record. I can't go into the hospital and get the discharge summary I did on so and so. I mean, they send me a paper copy, but I. This is all the privacy. That's maybe privacy. not the best example. It's the. People have taken, because it's so expensive to develop, people develop it for themselves. Mm -hmm. So the hospital does their thing, the mm -hmm. health authority does their thing. Physicians finally are getting electronic medical records in their office. Does it connect to any of that other stuff? Mm -hmm. No. And this is where I kind of, yeah, I just, so, and then we put social media on top of all of that. <laughs> what a match. We have got a conundrum. We really That's do. called a hash. So yes. anyway, if you're if you're if patients are sensing reluctance on the part of the physician mm -hmm. to communicate by text or email, it's just it's just they're not that comfortable with no. it yet because no. your information is not secure. Exactly. And how do we keep your story together? Exactly. So you shouldn't think there's sticks in the mud. They want to do it too. Yes. It's how do we do it carefully and protect you. This is a beauty, uh, I'm, I'm certainly not glad that you have lupus, but I'm so glad that you walk in our shoes too as a patient. Well, and yes. to help us see the conundrum, the dilemma, yeah. the, the ethical issues that are involved here is very interesting. Well, it's a strange place to be because a lot of those guys in there, those gals, those rheumatologists, I would refer to every day and talk to patients. In fact, right. I talked about today to one of the guys about a patient I'm going to send to him because he's got this weird illness right. and I know that he knows everything about it. Right. So I go have this doctor conversation over here mm -hmm. and then I come have a patient conversation yes. over here yes. and I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit. No, it's odd, no. but we are lucky to have you well on board, able to go to either I, side I of I realize that I, I can be an interpreter to the doc, to the specialist right? Right? on the patient's right? behalf, and I can be an interpreter to the patients on the specialist's behalf. You're a valuable, valuable person so, to know. So, I'll do that anytime. Excellent. Excellent. Now, did you want to touch further on immunizations? You talked yeah. about access to them, but was there something more about immunizations? Uh, I'm just going like to put my reading glasses Put on them here. on and away we go. So I did an interview here that I hope everybody will, I, I, as opposed to repeating the whole thing, what I'll say is go to the interview with me and Dr. Gordon Dow, who mm -hmm. talks about the five most important immunizations that can right. save your life if you have a rheumatologic disease. And I don't know why that, his lecture inspired me, regalvanized me so much around immunization. Immunizations has such a bad rap because of one terrible false misinforming study mm -hmm. in England where <laughs> this, this uh, doctor who's since been um, stripped of his privileges uh, um, produced a study with misinformation, deliberately misinformed people around Autism. Ah, uh, yes. Remember? I do. I do. I that do. went viral so fast, and before you knew it, I witnessed this in my own doctorhood uh, of patients suddenly refusing all immunizations mm -hmm. and refusing to immunize their children. Why do you say he deliberately did this? Oh, he didn't. He didn't. He falsified information. Oh, okay. He falsified. So it wasn't oh. even misinterpreting the data he had. He actually falsified data. Okay. And this was disproved. And this, the study was retracted, and there's, but the damage was done, mm -hmm. and it's been irreparable. Okay. Now we're starting to see. So this happened. When did this happen? Twenty years ago. Yeah, I think at least that. Okay. So you know, twenty years more in practice, some of my patients were starting to have children, and I started to see them Refusing. not wanting to immunize. And, right. and the thing is, they don't realize that. They're growing up and they haven't seen these childhood illnesses that you and I have seen, the right. withered polio leg, yes. the, yeah. the deafness and the you know, post-encephalitic and mm -hmm. the blind and the, um, you know, from some of these childhood illnesses right. that we can easily, easily prevent. And the reason, you know, this isn't an immunization 
lecture, the, the reason it's important to you, with me with lupus, you with whatever mm -hmm. rheumatologic disease you have, is our risk of being hospitalized or even dying from a serious infection is three or four times as high in us than anybody walking around out there. And the biggest thing we can do to prevent that from happening mm -hmm. is get immunized. Interesting. Get immunized against influenza. Mm -hmm. Get immunized against pneumococcus, which would be pneumovax, okay. uh, which is the, pneumo quote, the pneumonia shot, which you should get once in your life as an adult and repeated six years later. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you need that twice in your life. Okay. To be updated in the regular immunizations you used to get every 10 years, you mm -hmm. should get a diphtheria and tetanus immunization mm -hmm. with a polio okay. once. So diphtheria, tetanus every 10 years, and as long as you've had polio once as an adult, that's what you need. We had that as kids. You, everybody had all it? of those as Do we kids. still need you to update need to be polio? updated as, a, as, a, as, as an, an adult. adult. And the thing is, the immunizations have kind of fallen through the cracks. Yeah. We're so busy being sick people, right? Dealing with our illnesses, how complicated they are, all the drugs we have to take, our side effects of just getting on with our life. Mm -hmm. We, you know, immunizations are way back there. We yes. forgot all about them. It almost became it a dirty thing. word. It I know did. people that refuse to immunize their children. This is just, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Mm -hmm. Influenza, pneumonia, tetanus, tetanus diphtheria, and want every 10 years, polio once, and hepatitis A and B. A and B. A and B. Twin ricks, it's easy to do, especially, you know, if you're, if you're going to travel. Yes. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, it's just a series of a couple of shots. All these fat vi vaccines are not live vaccines, they cannot harm you. Okay, that was my next question, yes. doctor. Uh, a lot of people are concerned about the vaccines that use live virus as opposed to kill viruses. There, you do have to be careful. Yes. You should certainly ask your uh, rheumatologist Always. and your GP yes. and make sure you get consensus. Yes. Don't rush into a live vaccine situation. Yes. But it's turning out that some of these live vaccinations, like uh, uh, the shingles vaccination for some are, are fine to get. But what you need to do is have a consultation. And here's the other thing that's happened. I mean, some family doctors are excellent. I, I was very fastidious about that type of thing, kind of OCD, you know, kind of goes with the profession, <laughs> right? And I would have, when they came in for their physical, their immunizations would be reviewed. And I would never miss those every 10 year things. I mean, you know, that we did that. Uh, I lost my train I want to be clear on something, if you don't mind, while you're gathering your thoughts. For those who are on immunosuppressants, yeah. they have to be very, very concerned about a live virus injection, don't they? It's true to some extent, and it depends. It depends on how sick you are, mm -hmm. what the drugs are you, you're taking, right. like how immunosuppressed are you. For instance, you know, they don't consider Plaquenil, for instance, an immunosuppressant. Okay. It's immune modulating, it's protective, uh, but it's not a heavy duty immunosuppressant. Uh -huh. So you have to look at your illness, how ill are you, your drug profile, and also what illnesses you've had, what infectious illnesses you've had in your past. So um, if you're on super heavy duty uh, immunosuppressants, and let's say you had shingles a year ago and you're going, I don't want shingles again, give me that vaccination. Well, you might not be wanting to rush into that with a live vaccine, right. considering how heavily, how heavy your drug treatment right. is and the right. fact that you've already managed to so, have it. So always, always, always clear this with your GP and your rheumatologist. Yeah, and the thing that you have to be careful about now, there are now many providers of vaccinations. You can go to the health department, you know, to a, mm -hmm. an immunization clinic to mm -hmm. get vaccinations. Pharmacies now are starting to give a lot of that. They're getting into the vaccination yes, they business. Yes, they and you know, I don't know how rigorously they look at your history, your meds, your... I'm not questioning it. I'm presuming that they know what they're doing um, and doing it properly. But, um, you know, are they going to know how immunosuppressed you are? Are they going to know 
See that I I've got questions. We about have that. to be fastidious in our record keeping. Don't you we? are your own best advocate. So right. in this regard, I would say you should go to your GP mm -hmm. and go to your health department because they probably both have different immunization records on you right. and your kids. Mm -hmm. um, and and get a list of the shots from your GP. Get a list of the shots from the health department if they have any record. Mm -hmm. Make your own immunization record. Keep it in your wallet, mm -hmm. along with your medication list, like I know you do. I do? Everybody, <laughs> I do. everybody should. Yes, no, yeah, everybody should. Absolutely right. Next year, I'll talk about the medical record I've devised for people. Next year at the CRA? Yeah, why not? Why not? I'll, I'll throw it why at you not? and see what you think of it. Absolutely. Anyway, so yeah, immunizations, go, go look after it. It's a, it's a big department that can save your life. And we will just remind everyone that is watching this today, this interview happened yesterday, Thursday, February 27th at the CRA here in Whistler, right here on the Arthritis Broadcast News. And I'm sorry, the doctor that you interviewed was? Gordon Dow. Gordon Dow, that's the one to look for. Yeah. Now, I know you have to head back to the Lower Mainland. Yep. But before we let you go, and we don't want to, have you anything else you wanted to share, Dr. McCaffrey, before you go? I think, I think my mouth has moved on for just <laughs> the right amount of time. You know what? There's a difference between someone that talks a lot and someone that talks with a lot of information. Oh, I see. There's okay. a big difference. Oh, and that's I have very nice. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Oh, great. And I, I, I am truly uh, an admirer of your passion because it is the passion that we need to dredge up as patients. I don't care how sick people are. Dredge it up and stand up for yourself and advocate. And that means going to our politicians, going to our health authorities, etc., and saying, no, you try living with these diseases. We need the recognition. Yeah. We've done, we've paid our taxes, we've raised our families, we've, we've done charity work, we've, we've been part of our community. Don't turn your back on us. Yeah. Yeah. Hear us, listen to us, and let's get these things implemented. Well, you know, I think it would be great to, uh, you know, to use yeah. something like this as a way to help people write those letters. Absolutely. You know, uh, it's just easier if you do that in a group. So if you have yes. a support group, yes. you know, decide Four what your letters. issue is, yeah. get that letter out, allow people to personalize it with an adjective yes. here and there. Absolutely. You know, and, and get the stamp on the envelope and Excellent. Or tweet. Yes. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Do it. Do it. Because not just for us, but for the generations coming up. For so many of the autoimmune diseases that, you know, seven, nine out of ten patients are women, think about the daughters and yeah. granddaughters coming up. Let's stand up sure. now yep. and see what we can do to help them out. It has been an absolute pleasure. Well, Thank you very, very, Thank you very much. much. Thank you kindly.